Keep going. Yes, ma'am. There we right. go. All right. This is my, um, uh, just a little word about this. This is my summer garden in Ontario with swamp milkweed in the foreground and spirea in the background. Uh, we get tons. We're on the migration path for monarchs. Right. So um, I grow my garden and we get dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of monarchs. Um, and we've had several, uh, you can see the babies there, um, you know, a little caterpillar. So I just want to show you that because it makes me happy. Um, <laughs> maybe someday I'll get back there. Okay, so this slide shows, you know, what can you do now? Uh, or not now. I actually designed this speech for one I'm giving at the end of February, and then I was asked to do it at the end of January. So maybe wait a little while. Um, but if it warms up a little bit, you can plant any uh, fall bulb, you know, the bulbs that you were supposed to plant in the fall that were going to come up in the spring. You want to get those in the ground. They're not going to last a whole nother year. And they may not um, bloom as well as they would. When you go outside. Oops. Uh, if you planted them in the fall, but, the, but they'll bloom next year. Uh, especially these days, you want to um, order your seeds or go buy your seeds because everybody's buying seeds because everybody's gardening because everybody's stuck at home. So you don't want to wait on that. Um, there's some winter vegetables that you can sow now. I know I wasn't going to talk about vegetable planting, but um, you know, if you want to grow some kale or spinach or peas, um, or lettuce, um, starting in March, you can sow those directly into the ground. You will have to be vigilant for um, uh, uh, spring freezes. Um, you can uh, edge your beds, you can divide your perennials. And if you divide your perennials, you want to um, plant them a little bit deeper than you normally would because you, if, we, if you get frost heaves, they'll get pushed up. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, now is also the time to repot your indoor plants. Um, and you can use a mixture of compost, topsoil, and sharp sand. Um, alternately, try and find a potting soil that does not use vermiculite, perlite, um, or peat, because those have a very heavy carbon footprint. And it usually will say on the, um, oh, we're not done with this one yet. <laughs> um, it'll say on the package what's, what's inside of it. Um, if you put your tools away in the fall without cleaning them, like I did this year, uh, this is the time to do that chore. The problem with uh, keeping them dirty is that you can spread disease from plant to plant. So wash off any, uh, dirt that's on them. Clean rust spots with coarse steel wool. Do not use sandpaper. That will damage them. Uh, sterilize them with a 10% solution of bleach or a 70% solution of isopropyl alcohol. And uh, they'll be good as new. And if you have a knife sharpener somewhere in the area, not a bad idea to sharpen them as well. And I was specifically asked to talk about deer, and I'll go into deer a little bit later, but now is when you want to start spraying deer repellent. There is pretty abundant evidence that deer form a pattern of how they go around your neighborhood. And um, if you start spraying now and you spray on a regular basis um, and you rotate the the products that you use, you'll be able to um, hopefully mitigate deer damage. And we'll, we'll talk more about that later. I've lost the slide deck. Um, Barbara? Barbara, you're mu muted there, oh. okay. okay. Just, um, just, just leave it there. Yeah, next slide. Okay, so here's a few common winter weeds that you want to keep an eye out for. Um, you're not going to see them in January, but pretty soon, you're, especially with the warmth, the, you know, we've had a warm winter. 
Um, you can't tell from today, but uh, so hairy bittercress, lesser celandine and common chickweed are gonna start coming up. And you can either pull them by hand. If you have them all over the place and in your yard, you might wanna use a pre-emergent weed killer. Um, uh, but um, if you do, get one that does not have nitrogen in it, just you know, get a clean pre-emergent. Um, otherwise, these are pretty easy to keep under control if you're, if you're vigilant, especially the chickweed. If you let it go to seed, the seeds spray. So when you mow the lawn, they'll spray all over the place. So you really have to stay on top of that. Um, over the winter, I leave a, le uh, a layer of leaves or shredded leaves or mulch in my beds. I also leave um, stalks of all the perennials I have for architectural interest, but also because insects are beneficial insects like to um, burrow into mulch and they like to burrow into the stems of uh, some perennials and that's where they overwinter. And if you wait until April or so to clear things out, then they've had time to do whatever they need to do and move on. Um, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I lost my, it's hard to look back and forth. I'm not used to this. Um, I use a uh, shredded pine bark mulch um, when I do mulch because, um, thank you, uh, because I like the way it smells and it doesn't make a hard pack like some of the, um, hardwood mulches do. Um, it's also a little lighter, so the bags are easier to pick up. Um, when you mulch your trees, which you need to do, um, trees don't really like having a, the, the grass around the roots. So um, the picture on the right, the one that says nope, is what we in the business call a mulch volcano. And the problem with a mulch volcano is that having the mulch uh, around the base of the tree uh, promotes disease. Also, roots of trees don't grow down as most people think they do. They think of that tap root. They grow out in the first couple of inches of um, soil. So when you do this volcano thing, the roots try and grow up through the mulch to get the oxygen they need. So you wanna do what they do on the right-hand side, which says yes, my left, you're right, I guess. Um, and that's keep the mulch three inches away from the trunk of the tree, three inches of three inch deep and three feet circumference around the tree. Um, and you'll have a perfectly mulched tree and everybody will be proud of you for doing it like that. Uh, next slide. So pruning, we get a lot of questions about when to prune and spring, everybody gets out their clippers and they wanna go to it, but there's a where and a when. So shrubs that flower before the end of June, like azaleas, like rhododendrons and lilacs and forsythia, don't prune them now because you'll prune off all the buds and you won't get any. It won't kill them to prune them now uh, and if they're totally out of control and you just don't think you're gonna have time later, go ahead, but you just won't get any flowers. Um, for those plants that flower in the summer or in the autumn, you wanna prune those now because those tend to bloom on new wood. Uh, shrub roses, beautyberry, abelia, rose of Sharon. Um, those are the kinds of ones that you wanna do right now. Um, St. John's wort, which is also known as hypericum, uh, buddleias, which are butterfly bush uh, and smoke bushes, those can actually be cut down to about a foot off the ground. And hydrangeas are a whole nother lecture, but some hydrangeas you prune in the, you prune now and some you prune later. So um, ask me offline. If, uh, if you have concerns about whether or not to prune your azalea, your, uh, your hydrangea right now. Um, if you have a plant that you're growing for ornamental berries, you wanna wait until the fruit drops off. Uh, 
as soon as it gets nice, I'm gonna go and start trimming the old leaves off my hellebores. And you wanna be really careful about that because flowers are just starting to come up. And these are the Lenten rows that um, have become so popular. Um, and ornamental grasses you can cut back now. When you're pruning, you want to focus on damaged or dead limbs, limbs that are growing toward the center of the plant. I don't have a slide for this, sorry. <laughs> um, or limbs that are crossing and rubbing on each other. Um, and then, um, that's all I'm going to say about, about pruning. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about lawn care. Um, I prefer that you just get rid of your lawn. Um, and I'm going to get on my soapbox for a minute. Um, lawns are ecologically damaging. They don't make a lot of sense. And Washington, D.C. area in particular, we're in a transition zone where warm weather grasses, it's too cold, and cold weather grasses, it's too warm. So grass just doesn't like it here. Um, it's also a monoculture of mostly non-natives and it takes a tremendous amount of energy and carbon to keep happy. So if you can reduce the size of your lawn, do so. And here's you know, an example, somebody put in some flower beds, um, some garden beds, some raised garden beds or um, the photograph with the stones that looks like a swale to mitigate some water runoff. And um, there's a program in Montgomery County called Rainscapes, which will refund you some of your money for water mitigation. Um, I did not put that website uh, on my handout that Bev passed around or Barbara passed around, but it's just Rainscapes and Google Rainscapes and you can find it. So, um, you know, if you think about getting rid of your lawn and planting some wonderful native perennials, the time you spent mowing, you'll spend watching wildlife come back to your yard and won't that be fun? Uh, next slide. All that being said, there's a couple of weeds that you're gonna start seeing that really do need to be tackled now. Uh, Japanese stilt grass is a very aggressive invasive. If, if, you, if you go in Rock Creek, it's everywhere. Um, uh, and also crabgrass. If you have a little bit of these, um, you can control them by pulling them. Uh, if you have tons and tons of it, you wanna put down a pre-emergent herbicide. Uh, for Japanese stiltgrass, which blooms a little earlier, uh, you want to put it down in March. For crabgrass, you can put it down a little bit later. Again, uh, get a, uh, a product that does not have nitrogen in it because you don't need it. They're just trying to sell you more stuff. Um, the Japanese stiltgrass is an annual. If you pull it before it goes to seed and if you do it diligently, you can you can control it. Crabgrass is a little harder. You have to kind of dig it out. Um, the other thing you want to do is before you start putting any chemicals on your lawn is get a soil test. A soil test should dictate whether or not you need to feed your lawn, not your lawn care person or what it says on the bag of Scott's miracle Grow. Those might be two different companies. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Fertilizing with nitrogen in the spring is uh, not a good idea. Um, it promotes growth of the and greening up of the top of the grass, but it doesn't do anything for the roots. So really what you want to do is if you absolutely have to fertilize, you do it in the fall, you want to mow your grass high and you want to buy a mulching mower and just, you know, let the leaves go back into the earth and they'll feed it. Um, uh, next slide. This will be your favorite. Oh dear. What do we do about deer? Deer are here to stay. Um, and the only thing you can do, uh, besides putting a hundred foot tall fence around your property, which most of us can't do, 
I live in a neighborhood where you can't have any front yard fences. Um, if you're going to do a fence, it needs to be at least six to eight feet tall. The best thing to do is start using um, spray and spraying frequently, uh, as it says, you know, different brands have different um, requirements. Um, and the other thing to do is, is to plant plants that deer don't like as much. If you put a bunch of hosta in your yard, you might as well put out a neon sign saying, you know, all deer are welcome here. We love you. So I don't, I don't plant hosta. I like hosta. I don't have anything against hosta, but I do have something against deer. Um, but deer will eat just about anything that doesn't eat them first. And the only thing I know of that they don't touch, they don't eat hellebores for some reason. Um, so I use the products, the, the repellent products, the one that smell like rotten eggs. Um, it doesn't smell good, but it only lasts for, you know, that, that strong smell doesn't last forever. Um, I don't use the ones with coyote or wolf urine. I just don't even want to think about how they gather that up. Um, and I also use a product called Turbo Spreader Sticker, which you mix with the repellent um, and it helps cling to the plant a little better and a little longer. There are a lot of perennials that deer don't bother. Um, and I'm gonna, I have a whole list of plants I'm gonna talk to you about. And most of them, deer don't really bother all that much. But deer, like I said, they'll eat anything and they love new plants more than just about anything else. So if you're putting in a new shrub, consider protecting it for the first couple of years. Um, and then they seem to like the, the tender little babies as opposed to the, the more mature tree, plants and trees. And this is a fall issue, but if you plant a tree, make sure you protect it starting August against the deer rubbing their, um, their antlers against it. Um, next slide. Okay, um, so perennials versus annuals. Um, I don't use annuals for a couple reasons. One is I'm lazy and annuals you have to plant every single year. Um, and I'd rather just plant something and be done with it. Um, they also have a very, very high carbon footprint, um, as you can imagine. So that said, if you really want spring pop, what you want to put in are some pansies or snapdragons, violas. Violas will reseed. I don't know why they call them annuals. They come back. Um, and well, they are annuals, but they reseed. Um, and alyssum. One of my favorite annuals is a plant called Angelonia. Uh, it comes in a bunch of different colors. It looks beautifully when it's masked, um, but that you're going to plant later in the year, like in June. The rest of them, the pansies, violas, if you plant those in March, they like cool weather. And as long as it stays fairly cool, you'll have a nice, a nice array. So what is it about perennials and annual uh, natives that I love so much? Well, perennials come back every year and say hello. Uh, they fill in over time. Uh, you can create a diverse palette of colors and textures. Like in the picture here, you have Joe pie weed in the back. I think you have some zinnias in the front, maybe some phlox. It's a little hard to tell. I didn't take the picture. Um, and then in the winter, especially the Joe pie weed in the back gets a beautiful seed head. So it has a lot of winter structural interest. Um, and if you're using natives, uh, you get a lot of pollinators um, and it's beneficial for them and for other wildlife. Uh, next slide. So, um, Climate change is also, unfortunately, it already is affecting. If, if all of you are gardeners, and I'm assuming you are, um, you've seen it. We have much warmer winters. We have much hotter summers. 
we're getting more and more of these very torrential downpours and fewer of sort of the gentle rains that we used to get. Um, and so we have to plan for that, but we can also do something about it. We can use our gardens as a carbon sink. Um, so here's some things to think about. Um, you want to emphasize woody perennials over herbaceous perennials over annuals. Uh, you want to avoid species at the southern end of the range. So you don't want to plant a sugar maple in Washington, D.C. They're, they're moving north. Trust me, they're all over the place up where we go in northern Ontario, and that's becoming their southern range at this point. Um, plant more trees and shrubs, especially large, long-lived trees. And... Um, there's a program in Montgomery County called Tree Montgomery that will come and put a tree on your property. And I'm getting three of them in a month or so. So if you Google Tree Montgomery or you can ask me and I'll send you the information. If you sign up, it takes about two years to actually get a tree, but you know, it's a, I'm getting a bald cypress. I mean, these are big expensive trees. So um, I'm actually getting some uh, black gums too. Um, it's a good idea to grow regionally hardy native plants. Um, Non-native plants tend to be higher maintenance and they're more susceptible to disease. Uh, plant a diversity of things, you know, diversify. Diversity is wonderful. Um, you want to use mulch to retain moisture and to prevent weeds and uh, reduce the size of your lawn by doing all of the above. Next slide. So um, I'm, I'm going to talk, I'm going to go through my plantalog, <laughs> I guess. Um, Washington, D.C. is uh, in weather zone 7A, uh, meaning at the end of March, there's about a 90 degree, 90% ch chance of having a, uh, a freeze. And by May 4th, there's only a 4% chance. So um, or a 10% chance. So you can plant earlier than May 4th, which is sort of the technical last freeze day, but you just have to be vigilant. The most important thing to know about growing anything is um, put the right plant in the right place in the right conditions. If you put a sun loving plant in the shade, or a plant that hate wet, hates wet feet in a constantly moist area, and I do speak from experience, um, you'll be disappointed. But keep in mind, one of the best lessons you can discover as a gardener is that you can move plants around. If you make a mistake, dig it up and move it somewhere where it might be happier. Took me years to realize you could do that. I just let them die before. <laughs> So these are some of my favorite plants, and I know I've talked a lot about natives, but these are some of the ones I use that are not native. They are also known to not be invasive, and you have to be really careful about invasive species these days. Um, so I use a lot of something called Hakanakloa grass, also called Japanese grass. Um, it is, uh, it grows about 12 or so inches tall. It's beautiful on a hillside. It's a good stabilizer. Um, and when it blows in the wind, you get this beautiful, almost water effect. Um, in the fall, you get a very nice hay colored, um, grasses and then you cut them down. I'll be cutting mine back pretty soon. It's a warm weather grass so it comes up a little later in the season. Um, Lenten rose or hellebores are pretty popular. You can get them in any color, shape. You can get cool ones with cool leaves. They come up sort of first thing in the spring. So they're, they're just nice to have around and they're a real workhorse. They love the shade. Uh, Hakanakloa grass you can grow in, in sun or part shade. Uh, Sarcococa hucariana, also known as sweet box, is about a two foot, maybe three foot shrub. It's, a, it's considered a ground cover. It loves moist shade. 
It grows beautifully there. It gets teeny tiny little leaf, uh, flowers, which you'll never see, but you will smell them. They smell wonderful. Um, astilbes are another non-native that's not invasive. You, you can get just about any color imaginable and they're beautiful mast. They look beautiful with ferns um, and they have great wet, uh, winter interest. The, those spiky flowers stay up there with the, you know, kind of a golden uh, seed pod. Um, and a good foundation plant that's another workhorse and like sun is a cherry laurel. And this is an auto lucans. No, go. Sorry, my, my dog is. <laughs> hey, Bill, can you feed the dog? Okay. Oh, she's fed. She's fed. Ah, she's trying to trick me. Um, okay, so next slide. These are some sunny native perennials. Um, Amsonia blue ice um, gets, it's about a foot tall, these little willowy um, stems with beautiful, beautiful, bright blue flowers, just tons of them um, in the spring. And then in the fall, it get, it, it's got a beautiful fall color. And you don't really think about perennials having beautiful fall color, but it does. So um, I'm going to let Esther in the waiting room. There we go. Um, uh, Pycnanthemum mudica, yeah. oh, uh, which is also known as mountain mint. Uh, mountain mint blooms uh, July through September. The blooms aren't gorgeous, but they smell really good. Um, it's uh, Masses of them, it, it makes quite an impression. Mountain mint is a prime source of nectar for pollinators. And so if you love watching bees and butterflies and bugs come by your yard, you'll love mountain mint. It is a little bit of a bully. So put it in a place where it can spread and be happy um, or just pull it up <laughs> and keep it under control. Um, Asclepius tuberosa is a, is a butterfly weed, um, so uh, it attracts butterflies. Um, I, get a, I have a ton of it up in Canada. I get a lot of monarchs on it. Um, it's a milkweed. It's a, it, there's a bunch of different kinds of milkweeds. Um, it will spread. Um, it's a prolific spreader. You can get ones that are three and a half feet tall, and you can get ones that are smaller, so be sure you read the label on what you're growing. Um, that blooms a little bit uh, in the late spring and if you deadhead it you will get some more blooms. Um, if you're lucky you'll get a bunch of caterpillars which will eat it. Uh, next slide. Oops, did we skip one? Yeah, so these are some more sun lovers. Um, Agastache, Penstemon and Monarda, uh, they're all, they all attract um, uh, hummingbirds and uh, other pollinators. Uh, Agastache is about a four foot stem, no, I'm sorry, about a, a three foot stem with this uh, beautiful purple blue um, flower, spiky flower on the top. It blooms uh, late summer and fall. Um, and then it gets golden foliage. It's attracted, it, it attracts butterflies and hummingbirds. Uh, Penstemon digitalis, don't, don't eat it. Um, it. It's not good for you if you eat it. Also called beard tongue. It blooms in, the ju in June. It's a semi-evergreen, especially the basil leaves. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, it, the deer have not eaten mine, <laughs> Esther. Um, I guess got a, a question. In fact, I have some sedums right next to my penstemon and the, the I, I think I have the sedums there just because I, I like to torture myself. They never bloom. The, the deer eat them the minute they come up. But the penstemon they haven't touched. Um, Monarda is also known as beer, uh, bee balm or um, wild bergamot. 
Bergamot is the flavoring, I believe, an Earl Grey tea, and you can make tea out of these. I have not done that, so be careful. I don't recommend eating any plant that, unless you really know what you're doing, um, but these bloom in the summer. They get these beautiful kind of moppy looking, you can kind of see, you can't see my hands, but I'm um, sorry about that, and um they can tolerate drought there. So that that's a, you know, a thought if you have a very sunny, dry area, they're, they're good there. Uh, next slide. Um, I didn't know what to name this slide. So this is random ground covers that I like and use a lot. Um, Cisrinchium augustifolium, which is called blue eyed grass. Uh, it, grows in sun or part shade. It's evergreen. In the spring, you get these gorgeous blue flowers with a little yellow um, middle. Um, and it, it blooms for quite a long time. Deer do not eat it. It's a slow spreader, but it forms a thick enough mat that really I haven't had uh, too many um, weed problems where I have it growing. I have it growing in a, in a woodland garden. Uh, blooms sort of May through July. You get a big burst of blooms and then you kind of get, get little blooms. Um, down just below that is a uh, geranium maculatum, uh, also known as crane's bill. This is a part shade plant. Uh, it blooms late spring, early summer. It gets a really nice fall color. Uh, color. And it'll reseed. You'll, you'll find this in parts of your garden that you didn't plan on having it, which is fine, because then if you want it there, great. And if you don't, you can dig it up and move it. And you get free plants. Um, those are both natives. Deer do not eat either one. In fact, as far as I know, deer don't eat any of these. Um, Serratostigma plumbaginoides is plumbago or leadwort. This is a full sun ground cover. Uh, also get, I, you, you can probably tell at this point, I like blue. Um, these get purple blue flowers and um, absolutely gorgeous fall color. And I have these at the base of my uh, cherry laurels. So, you know, when the cherry laurels, laurels have stopped blooming, I get these and then this beautiful fall color around this, these evergreen plants. Um, it, this is not a, uh, a native, but it is also not um, invasive. And uh, Stairway to Heaven, the pulmonium, is very similar to um, uh, Jacob's Ladder. So the, uh, you know, you get this shoot with the little leaves opposite coming off of them and these very sweet little bell-shaped flowers in the spring. Um, it's a good woodland ground cover. Um, it blooms, I'm trying to see. You know what? I don't even have that one in there. I threw this one in at the last minute. Um, so next slide. Uh, some more, these are all shade plants. Um, I do a lot of woodland gardening and I'll show you at the end my latest project. Uh, the uh, Tiarella cordifolia, which is foam flower, um, we're this is a native, but there are gazillions of cultivars, so you can get ones that have sort of oakly, you know, oak leaf, leaf shaped leaves and pink spikes and white spikes and some with uh, more maroony kind of leaves. So uh, it goes well with hookera. It's sort of uh, similar to that. And you all mass together, you get a, just a whole forest of these spikes coming up in the spring. And uh, they last quite a long time, quite beautiful. It, here in my garden, they're semi-evergreen. Um, I, I still see some leaves. Um, green and gold, the chrysogonum, uh, another workhorse uh, shade uh, ground cover with, um, again, this is one of those plants that gets a bunch of flowers and then sporadically will flower throughout the summer. Um, and Lobelia syphilitica, it's hard to find a tall plant that'll bloom in the shade, but this one will. 
Uh, it's called blue cardinal flower. It has a sister, a cousin, which is red cardinal flower. I don't think this one spreads as voraciously as the red cardinal flower, which will eat your yard. But if you wanted to, you get a lot of red flowers. But it's a nice plant to have because it's it's taller and it blooms in the, in the shade. Uh, next slide. Uh, more shade perennials. Um, Hookera, uh, you've probably all heard of. It also comes in a ton of different cultivars. Um, I love it. Uh, it blooms in the late summer and fall. If you're lucky, in my yard, the bunnies eat it. Often before, you know, it'll flower and then it'll be gone. Um, but if you spray it, and if you use a spray with capsaicin, which is like chili pepper, um, that'll usually keep them away. But, you know, you never know with animals. There are animals that appear to love pepper. Um, uh, Phlox stolonifera, or creeping phlox. This is a nice spreader. The hookera doesn't spread much. And, you know, where you plant it, it stays. You're not going to get a whole bunch of new ones. But the phlox will spread all over the place. And it's, um, it's a good, solid um, ground cover. Uh, fills in nicely. It blooms April and May. It's somewhat evergreen. Um, and it's a good pollinator uh, uh, attractor. Uh, one of my all-time favorite woodland plants is the iris cristata or dwarf crested iris. Uh, it's a good spreader. It's almost too good, but that means you get more plants and you can dig them up. Um, it grows on these little corms and um, it, it does die back completely. So you have to be careful that you don't step on it or crush it when you're walking around your garden. But in the early spring, um, or, I'm sorry, um, mid to late spring, you get just masses of iris, irisy like flowers. Um, and it's low, it's about maybe five inches off the ground. So you can plant it amongst other things that, you know, when it dies back, something else will come up. Uh, next one. Um, on the left, you have aqua, Aqualegia, which is columbine. Uh, this cultivar here is called Little Lantern. So it's a low growing one. It's maybe about eight inches as opposed to some of the taller ones, which can, you know, 12 to 15. Um, it'll spread. It's um, not quite as hardy as some of the other perennials, but it's, it's such a beautiful, delicate flower. Um, and you can see it, it pairs very, very nicely with ferns. Um, wood aster, white wood aster in the center um, is a, another native. It blooms like all asters do in the fall. Um, this one here, will, it, it's, it's aggressive. It will, it will spread, which again is a good thing if you want it to. And if you don't, you need to be vigilant and kind of pull it up. But it just gets masses of these um, white flowers with a little yellow center. Um, Epimedium is not a native, but it's one of my all-time favorites. And there are many cultivars and many different shapes and colors of both the flowers and the leaves. Uh, this one here is Sulfurium. And the flowers come out in early spring. And um, this is kind of a, it's like an almost buttery gold beautiful flower. It's a good ground cover. It's good on slopes because it'll mass in a way that will hold hold the soil. Uh, next slide. And don't forget ferns. Uh, ferns are fabulous structural plants. Most of them are semi-evergreen. Um, well, polystichum across Decroides is not the Christmas fern. Um, the dry, uh, the autumn fern, <laughs> uh, brilliance. The, the autumn color actually is what comes up in the spring, not in the fall. Uh, it's a fairly tall fern um, and it spreads slowly but nicely. It just, it's just absolutely gorgeous. I have a lot of it. Um, ostrich fern is a terrific accent, uh, but it's very tall. 
um, like three feet. So you need you need room. Uh, the cinnamon fern is the same. Um, it, it's very tall and big, but it gets these very dramatic spikes in, in the spring. Um, so don't forget to use those. Uh, they're, they're good on slopes. They're good in, you know, if you have an area that's kind of wet, you know, go for it. Um, next slide. And also don't forget about spring ephemerals. So um, you've all heard of Virginia bluebells and um, you know, these are the plants that, that come up in the spring and then they die and they go away. Um, but they come up early and they make you feel like, you know, spring is coming and life is renewed. Um, the Mertensia is a, it's a native. Um, it, my experience has been that wherever I plant it, that's not where it comes up next year. I don't know how that works, but um, it just goes away there and comes up somewhere else. Um, Erythronium americanum is a trout lily. These are bulbs that you plant in the fall and they come up in the spring. And the one thing about them is that where you put them is where they're gonna stay. They don't like to be dug up and moved. They're, they're picky. Um, there's two kinds of Dutchman's britches that I use or, or dicentra, uh, the native Dutchman's britches and then the non-native uh, that we're more familiar with bleeding heart. Um, these look beautiful with ferns, by the way. They, same kind of uh, foliage. Um, next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, my, my favorite shrubs. Um, the one non-native here is an Edgeworthia. Um, Edgeworthia has a couple of different things that recommend it. One is that the new wood has in the uh, winter has these beautiful leaf scars. So it's, it's got that winter interest going for it. Also in the winter, the flower buds hang down from the very ends of the little branches um, and they bloom in February or very early March. And they, they bloom upside down. So they hang down like this and then they just kind of get bigger. And when you walk by them, they smell fabulous. Um, and then they have a, a nice leaf shape the rest of the year. Uh, it is a suckering plant. So I take like all the ones I have now are babies of ones that I had before. Um, uh, and then in the fall, it gets a nice yellow fall color. Uh, Father Gilla is, um, blooms also before the leaves come out and uh, gets very nice smelling um, sort of puffball uh, flowers, as you can see right here, almost looks, you know, kind of cottony, uh, has a lovely smell. And uh, uh, as well, it has a um, beautiful, beautiful fall color. It's just spectacular. Um, Itea virginica, little, this is a little garnet. So this is a small uh, Virginia sweet spire. There's a Henry's garnet, which is bigger. Um, this blooms after it leaves out and gets kind of uh, droopy white spiky flowers coming out. This does very well in moist shade. So if you have an area that's moist, uh, go for it there. This one blooms in uh, May, June, and July. Also has a gorgeous, gorgeous fall color. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of these is big and one is little. The um, bottle brush buckeye is an unusual plant, but as you can see, it's a very dramatic looking plant. When it leaves out in the spring, it looks like it's in pain. Or the leaves all kind of drop down like this, and then they eventually fill out. You get uh, these, these flowers are probably eight to 12 inches. Um, and they attract hummingbirds and they attract butterflies. In the fall, you get chipmunks who want to eat the buckeyes off of them. They're not terribly deer resistant. This is one of the few plants that I have planted in a place where deer can't get to, um, but they're worth it because they're just gorgeous. And then it gets another beautiful yellow color in the fall. The Rus aromatica is an 
fragrant sumac. It's, it's a low growing plant about three feet tall. Um, it gets yellow catkins in the spring and these nice little red berries. And it also turns a lovely fall color. This is also really good for um, slope stabilization. Um, you can grow it in the shade. It's just sort of the, I know it says sun there, but, and these are, these are both native plants. Um, next slide. Um, Lakothoe fontanegia, um, I put this in and I did not put this in the handout. So I, I was watching a uh, murder mystery and the person got murdered by a datura plant. And I suddenly, I woke up at three in the morning and I said, oh my gosh, I didn't put on there. This, this is a poisonous plant. If you have little kids or if you have pets that chew on plants, don't plant it. Um, it's highly toxic. I, I've not really heard of people dying from it, but I want to give you that caveat. However, it is gorgeous. Um, it's also very picky. It likes moist, well-drained acid shade, and it doesn't like to be moved. It doesn't like to be talked to, doesn't like to be looked at, <laughs> but it's quite pretty. Um, it has, um, you know, these little flowers that grow in the leaf axles. Um, and deer don't eat it, they won't touch it. So I actually have it in a place where I have tremendous deer pressure that babies and dogs can't get to. Um, it is an evergreen and the leaves turn kind of red in the winter. So it, it doesn't, they don't turn red and fall off but they, they get this kind of nice reddish hue. Uh, next slide. And this is my, my plant of the week or plant of the year. Nobody's, uh, raise your hand. Well, I can't see you, but you know, if you've heard of this plant, um, I got to hand it to you. You're a gardener. Spigelia marilandica woodland pink root uh, shade, part shade. You can see the flowers, um, red and yellow flowers. It can be very prolific. It's picky. If you can get it to grow, great. Um, I've gotten three of them to grow happily um, and I'm trying to, to get some more, but it's just a, a beautiful woodland plant that adds a lot of splash of color. Um, and it's a native, I have seen hummingbirds at mine, um, which I love. It, uh, it comes up late in the spring. So the one thing you have to be careful about is that you don't go, oh, a blank spot, I can put something else in there. You have to remember that you planted it. Uh, next slide. So this is a, a brief view of a woodland garden. I'm making about a third of my yard is going to become a woodland garden. And I started by planting red buds and a couple other uh, native trees called halesias, one non-native called a uh, katsura. And um, I also have a Kentucky yellowwood. And I have three huge um, oak trees along the edge of my yard that are, belong to the county. So I laid down uh, paper and cardboard um, last spring and then in October just plowed it in. And uh, we have a lot of the plants here that I've, that I've already talked about. Uh, you can see beyond it is the next stage. It's gonna be four stages. It's got a path through it. I'm hoping I can get a, bo a boulder or two, but we'll see about that. So things that you can do when you have a lot of time on your hands and are retired. <laughs> um, next slide. Uh, this talk was brought to you by the University of Maryland Extension Master Gardening Program. And the last slide. Thank you very much. This is a view from my cabin in Ontario. That's Lake Huron and that's my rainbow. And uh, so I just wanted to share that with you and thank you very much for your time and patience with me today. Thank you. Thank you. Can we ask a couple questions?
Yeah, it, it, it's up to Barbara and Bev. They're they're the boss. Okay. Um, I I live in Howard County, and when you were talking about the tree Montgomery, is that something if you're in a neighboring county that you could um, maybe get some information on and participate in that? Uh, that no, they don't plant in Howard County, but um, my I would not be surprised if there were a similar program there. So what you might want to do is contact Tree Montgomery and ask them if there's a tree Howard. Okay, okay. Like or contact the Howard County Master Gardeners, they would know. Okay, there, I did get some, um, what are they, red stemmed uh, kind of bush red, tree. Red twig dogwood. That's it, that's yeah. it. I got that last year from Eco something. I'll have to look them up. The other question I have is in the past, this time of year, um, I have a friend that's on right now, Kay Stringfellow, and she uh, is very active in the Anne Arundel Master Gardening Program. I'm looking to find a seed swap, and I'm wondering, is anything like that happening this year? Uh, somewhere where you could drop seeds off, pick seeds up? Uh, there are no in-person Master Gardening programs anywhere in Montgomery County. Um, due to COVID, so there's no sw seed swaps. The only thing we're doing, um, one of the activities that I do is um, keep up the healing garden at the Walter Reed USO. And we've been allowed to go there in very small socially distanced groups and just keep it up. Cause if you don't, you know, it'll just go back to what it was before. But there's absolutely nothing in person, unfortunately. You might be able to pull together a non-sanctioned, right? One, you know, but yeah, none of the none of the master gardener programs that I know of are active right now. Okay, and my last question is about butterfly weed. It took yeah. me about two or three years to get it established, and it is in very good shape. And I've gathered seeds, and I do um, have like the little milk jug. Uh, that I put out as little greenhouses. And I was wondering if anybody had had success um, with taking the seeds from a butterfly weed. You made it sound like it spreads very easily. So I guess that's something that I could do. Yeah, just, just let it go. Um, uh, I haven't, I've grown it from seed, but those were seeds that I got actually from somebody else. It, it never occurred to me to try and, um, gather seeds from it because yeah, it grows by itself pretty easily. But, you know, go for it, try it, look, you know. Um, I don't I, I don't have any instructions on how to grow it from seed because- Okay, well maybe I, I'll go. I guess use what was on the back of the, I guess grew it like any other seed. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you, I really appreciate this. It's kind of uh, nice to be able to see see you this way, even if I can't come to a meeting. So. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I'd like to know in this region what the good uh, grass seed to use is. I planted some seed last uh, summer. It got uh, hot in uh, August and it all died out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, tall fescue um, is, is, is the one. Uh, the other thing to consider is, um, you know, unless it's an area that, you know, the one nice thing about grass is you can walk on it. Um, but if you're willing to plant some other things, um, if it's not an area that has a lot of um, foot pressure, you can look at some of the Carexes, like Carex Pennsylvanica. Um, and those are, you know, they're, they're sedges, they're not grasses. Um, Carex Pennsylvanica is a shade grass, um, so you don't want to use that one if it's in bright sun. But it, you know, if you're talking about a piece of your lawn that you might be able to get rid of, there's um, a lot of information about uh, putting in alternatives that kind of look like grass, but you can't walk on them as much. But tall fescue is sort of the, that's the grass of the, uh, of, this area, like I said, this is a terrible place to grow grass. We're, we're in what's called that transition zone. So it's 
too cold for warm weather grass and too hot for cold weather grass. I'd like to break in here because we definitely want to be able to get Bob in and for her talk about containers and herbs oh, yeah. and some of those things. Uh, and then if you have any other questions, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure we circle back around at the end to pick up any, any other questions. But I know that Betsy has, can't be with us the entire time. And we want to give Robin enough, enough time to get in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is really, really interesting. This is fascinating. Uh, I'm going to un... Let's see. I'm going to make sure. Okay. No, you're unmuted. All right. Now I've got a slide for you. And... Okay. Let's see. Open the... Okay. Let's see if I can share my screen. Let's try it again. All right, is everybody seeing it? Yes, yes, okay. Um, can you scroll down a, a little bit? Yes, I can. Okay. All right, a little uh, bit. maybe a little more. Here we go. All right, there, there, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, okay. Now, okay. Um, first I would like to thank Betsy. I learned a tremendous amount. Um, Hi, I'm Robin, I live in Kent Mill, and I uh, want to talk to you about container gardening, specifically trying to grow vegetables and herbs in containers. And uh, you can use uh, all kinds of containers. They do not have to be fancy. Uh, you can recycle things in your house. If you have uh, a gallon milk jug, you can cut the top off and poke some holes in the bottom as long as you have drainage. And that makes a, uh, it's big enough to grow most kinds of herbs. So you can save some money that way. Uh, also, you can uh, garden with things out of your refrigerator. Uh, see this? Okay, if you can, you can see that. Um, this is, um, this is just scallions that I, you, you plant the white part in a little bit of potting soil. And this is planted in um, packaging from spaghetti jars, spaghetti sauce jars, okay? So you put in a couple of handfuls of soil and this is called cut and come again. If you cut the bulbs high enough on the scallions, you can keep these going for months, five, six times anyway. And then you always have fresh scallions and this just needs a little sunny windowsill. You don't have to do anything too fancy with that. Okay. Um, so about this slide, this is my daughter, Julia, and she's the one that got me into it because at the beginning of the pandemic and we were trying to figure out what are we gonna do? And there was some kind of video about if you have a tomato, you can grow your own tomatoes. So I had a tomato and we ordered some Jiffy Pots. Jiffy Pots, you can see in the under bed boxes, the sort of brownish cardboard looking ones. And what's nice about uh, Jiffy Pots are they are fully compostable. So if you're growing in there, you do not have to transplant. If you need it to put it in a larger container, it'll, you, can, you can break it up a little bit so that the roots uh, come out a little bit, but you don't have to uh, take the plant out of the pot and put it in another pot. And again, I am not an expert, but it does this thing called root shock and it can wreck your plant. So you, you don't want to uh, pull it out and put it in if you can avoid that. So we started out with um, the, the seeds from one tomato and it does not work every time because some tomatoes are treated or radiated. And if that happens, you might get a little bit of a sprout, but then it just never continues. So you need to get um, a tomato that is not treated if you wanna try to grow from a tomato and not from seed. So anyway, we, we found our lucky tomato and you can see in this first picture, uh, the, the larger pots uh, down toward the front, um, there, I start out with five in, in each one 
uh, which is way too many for that size. And I knew that, but I was waiting to see which, uh, see which ones would be the hardiest. So then I, I thinned it down to three and, and those are 10 gallon pots. And uh, I used miracle Grow potting mix and a fish fertilizer, a liquid fish fertilizer called Dr. Earth's. Uh, so this is the, just the, the, on, on the porch at uh, the beginning of June. And then if you can scroll down to the next picture, this is the porch in the end of September, beginning of October. And those little tomato plants, uh, some of them got to about nine feet high. And we grew, um, these were not air, this was not an heirloom tomato, okay? Uh, it was not open pollinated. Open pollinated, if you see that on a seed packet or in a seed catalog, it means it will grow exactly what you see on the seed packet. In other words, it will reproduce true. Uh, the things you have in the grocery store often do not do that. And we got some um, very strange looking tomatoes, but they were all edible and we had a lot of fun roasting them and eating them fresh and giving them to neighbors. And they really worked well. And uh, again, a, a cost saving idea. You do not have to buy plant ties. If you uh, have pantyhose that have seen better days, you can cut them up. They make great plant ties and you can use them over and over again if you keep them clean, if you wash them because you don't, there are a lot of diseases that can affect tomatoes. So you, you don't want to transfer things from plant to plant. You, you need to keep them clean. Uh, on the porch, we also grew cucumbers. Uh, not such good luck with squash this year. Uh, a lot of herbs, uh, a little bit of, of broccoli. We had pretty good luck with uh, bush beans, soybeans uh, scallions. So, and this was all on our, our porch and we, we have a cape. Now you will notice sort of there's this screenish looking stuff that's wrapped around the porch supports and that is deer fencing. What I did to keep the deer away was wrap my porch in deer fencing and you can get a roll of it at Home Depot. You can order it online. And I used, um, the five foot Vigoro garden stakes. They're metal stakes with a little bit of a plastic coating and I just um, stuck them in the ground and uh, used cable ties to attach the deer fencing to it and that kept the deer away. Uh, it did not work so great with the chipmunks but um, thankfully we didn't have too many problems with the chipmunks. Okay so so anyway, you can see that you can go in a few months from having a few things in a few pots to, to really having a nice harvest. And we were able to harvest fresh vegetables each week for about a two and a half month time. And again, this is not in the ground. This is just in containers on the porch and you can move them around to catch the sun. You can, uh, if you have gutter runoff, you need to move them back so they don't get drowned. We found that out the hard way. Uh, but this is, this is very attainable. This is an attainable goal. So um, I want to show you a couple of easy ways to get started that don't cost a lot of money. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm done with the, the slide part. Okay. 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 So these are called peat pellets. Okay. And you can buy them in bags of uh, 25, 50, 100 if you're very ambitious. And they're compressed peat. And they come with this sort of a netting around them, which you can't really see. But basically what you do is you put these in about half an inch of water for half an hour or so. And then they pop up and they become a place where you can drop seeds. And I will show you, there. This is um, the first generation off of the tomatoes that we harvested in the fall. We um, let a couple of the tomatoes that had some problems from the chipmunks, and uh, we let them uh, just sit for a while in a jar until they rotted out. And then we rinsed off the tomato pulp and 
what's called fermented the seeds. You just soak them in water for about a day, a day and a half. And you keep the ones that float. No, wait, you keep the ones that sink. Sorry, you keep the ones that sink. And then you just dry them off on a paper towel and then plant them. And then lo and behold, we're going to hopefully have tomatoes this spring. And uh, this is in a seed dome starter. You can see that. And it's just the, these little trays that comes with these lids. And at the beginning, when you um, saturate the peat pods and put in a seed, you put the lid on top. And if you're using grow lights, at the very beginning, before anything pops, you can leave it under the grow lights all the time. But you don't, once they sprout, want to leave them under the grow lights all the time. Or if you have your grow lights on a timer, you shouldn't have the light on them for more than seven or eight hours a day, or it, it's, it stresses the plant, it's bad for it, and they'll start to curl, and you don't want that to, to happen. But um, these are, um, th this is something else you could do with milk cartons. Cut them up, and you can make plant tags. Free. Um, so these are, we, we started from seed on January 5th, and they're just about ready to go into the next size container. And for this, we are using, um, you know those red party cups? They're great. You just punch a hole in the bottom or a few smaller holes in the bottom. You add some more uh, potting mix. And uh, once these are about five inches high, I will put them out in the 10 gallon containers, two, two per 10 gallon container. And we had good results with that. So that it's very easy. And again, this is just from that first tomato, no seed yet. You can also get uh, these divided seed trays that go in the domes. And for this, you can use potting mix and it, it works very well. I really like the peat pellets. I, I just, I, um, I, I find that, um, the seed starts more successfully and I get a better germination rate than I did with just uh, growing in, in soil in, in deed. So I, I can recommend uh, pea pellets to you. Okay, so um, what do you need to do this? Um, you, need, you need a location that the deer can't get to with a decent Southern exposure, okay? Uh, you need an area that gets at least six hours a day of direct sun. Most vegetables need direct sun. Um, if you find that your plants are stressed, there are a couple of things you can do. You can move them to a shadier part of, of the porch. Um, you can use shade cloth. And if you Google search shade cloth, there are a lot of places that sell it. Uh, we did not use shade cloth. I just um, move the pots every so often. If it gets above 88, 89 degrees, you are probably going to want to put your plants in the shade if you're container planting and you can move them to, to get them out of the sun because uh, I found that uh, that was very stressful, uh, particularly for uh, the, the squashes and the cucumbers. You need to they love they love sun, but just just so much. We have very strong sun here. Um, in terms of uh, other things, you can try to to grow tomatoes are are, are great. Uh, we had very good luck with uh, a basic kind of cucumber called a marketer cucumber. Uh, we had also very good luck growing cayenne pepper and. Uh, a word about, okay, a word about things like cauliflower, cabbage, and broccoli. Kent Mill has uh, an abundant supply of cabbage worms and these cute little white moths, little black spots, okay? Once you see them, it is essentially too late. You have them. Once you see these little moths flying around your plants, you know you have cabbage worms, okay? But there's something you can do about it. There is absolutely something you can do about it. Uh, there is a, um, a natural 
product called, um, and I'm going to get this wrong and Betsy can say it right, Bacillus thuringiensis BT spray. You can get it at Home Depot. You can order it on Amazon. Uh, you can get it pre-mixed or you can get it in concentrate. That's what I did because it was uh, the most economical and we had a lot of plants. Um, and there will have the instructions on there for how much to put in. It's usually like a teaspoon, a teaspoon and a half per quart. And you can pick up some just um, plain clean spray bottles, label it very, very uh, prominently. So someone doesn't like try to clean the sink with it or something. Uh, and you can uh, spray your plants. I sprayed twice a week and it kept them under control. It doesn't eliminate them entirely, but it will keep the numbers way down, way down, okay? Uh, another pest you have to watch out for is called tomato hornworm. There are these big green caterpillars. They like to come out at night. They are exactly the same shade as the tomato plant. They are hard to see. You can get um, these black light flashlights and you go out at night with this black light flashlight and you shine it at your tomato plants. And if you see something that's bright purple, that's a tomato hornworm. The, the BT keeps them uh, also under control, um, but they are pretty hardy. I was very surprised by how hardy these things are. Um, an okay, an another thing you, you need to watch out for uh, with uh, vegetables is different kinds of fungal problems. Okay, uh, they can be, um, the most common kind is this, this sort of a whitish mildew looking stuff, okay? There are some home remedies you can try for that, including spraying with diluted milk. That worked pretty well for a while, then it stopped working. To this year, we're going to use neem oil, N-E-E-M oil. It's uh, also organic. You can again get it at Home Depot or from Amazon. You can get it pre-mixed or you can do the dilute. I got the pre-mixed. Neem oil has a little bit of an odor to it that you might not like. So I didn't want to spend a lot of time mixing it and things like that. So I, I just prefer to get the, the pre-mixed spray. And again, it's something you have to keep up. You need to spray the um, top and underside of the leaves and uh, you know, keep it keep it in check because if you see this sort of whitish powdery looking fungus, it can take over a plant very fast. Just a general tip, if you see something wrong, don't ignore it or think it's going to go away, get at it or because you can, you can lose a lot of broccoli very fast. Okay, I'll put it uh, that way. It's astonishing um, how fast. Um, other things that we had good success with, herbs, okay? All you need to grow herbs is uh, if you have uh, the kinds of boxes that salad come in or that uh, the small tomatoes come in, the small tomato assortments, they already have holes. They're great. You just put potting mix in there, moisten it, mix it up, get some packets of herb seeds and uh, sprinkle on uh, the, the seeds, cover them lightly and make sure that they stay moist. And depending on the, the type, you'll have something that you can use for dinner in anywhere from two to six weeks. The seed packets uh, for most companies have excellent instructions on them for how many days to maturity. And a lot of seed companies have videos even that you can look to see like, are your plants uh, looking the way they should. So it's very, very helpful. There are some seed companies that even have helplines where you can call or send them questions. So they are, uh, particularly with what happened during the pandemic, they are um, very nice to beginning gardeners as I probably asked some real newbie questions, but they were very nice. And again, we had terrific harvest. So it was a cooperative effort from a lot of seed companies. And if if you, okay, another thing you can do if you don't wanna try messing with, with seeds is you can get plant starts, which are small plants, a little bit bigger than the tomatoes I just showed you. There are a lot of places to get them locally. You can Google search that. Everybody has their favorite place. Um, also, if you make friends with gardening neighbors, they can share plant starts with you. 
that's what, what I did for some of it. So this year we're able to offer starts, which is a nice, nice change. Um, if you use starts, um, you can put them out, I would say after March 15th, about March 15th. And uh, if you go to someplace big like Home Depot, they, they know all about these things, obviously. Um, you can set them out uh, in mid-March and not have to worry about it, as long as your fencing is up, as long as your fencing is up. Um, and I really do recommend fencing because if, um, if you try spray, I didn't have good luck with that uh, because we, you know, tomatoes are a powerful attractant. Uh, Irish spring, the deer don't like it, but you will get raccoons. That, here's here's a, a tip for you. If you put out Irish spring, it's like a raccoon buffet. They can be very aggressive and cause a lot of damage. And I wish someone had told me this before <laughs> I tried it. So um, use fencing and if spray works for you, great. Um, spray did not work so well for our particular situation because our neighbors have an apple tree and you they, they will line up to go to the apple tree and they don't mind the smell so much because they know that they're going to get apples at my neighbors. Um, Robin, do you mind if I interject just a yeah. second? Um, yeah. The other thing you need to know about deer repellent sprays is there are some you should not spray on edibles. Good. Yeah. You have to be really careful and know what you're, what you're spraying. And apparently they don't work very well anyway. It's great in information about the Irish spring though. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, we did not have much luck with deer repellent last year, but of course we did put in hostas. A friend of mine is a, is a gardener, is a landscaper, and he swore up and down that the hostas would not be a problem. And I said to him, I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> and sure enough, they, they were gone and they were gone and they, you know, and they were new. And so, yes, they were, they were tasty. Uh, our deal was that if indeed he was wrong, he would come back and he would put something else this year. So we will talk. It's almost that time. Uh, but I wasn't surprised when you said hostages were a problem, Betsy, because uh, and everybody else, my friend, you know, I had another friend around here who said, hostages? He told you to put it hostage? No. It, it, no, it, uh, honestly, tr truly, uh, the deer here in Kent Mill eat things that they shouldn't want to eat. That's right. And so that's why I wrap my porch in deer fencing because that's the only thing I found that, that worked because you can, you can try you can try different methods. And like you said, maybe you, maybe you will have better luck. But uh, I, I settled on the deer fencing and this year we're, expand we're expanding into raised beds. So um, I'm putting a lot of stock in that uh, deer fencing. And, oh yes, um, what, from what Betsy said, we, we do organic gardening. So um, things like BT and neem oil are considered organic. And you have to look at the product label to see if it's certified as organic. Um, I know that different people have different opinions about this, but um, I, I felt, it was my personal opinion, that it was a safer and more helpful thing to do, that it didn't uh, put substances in the environment that were harmful to pollinators, okay? Yeah. There are not a lot of pollinators in Kent Mill, okay? Um, you may find that you have to hand pollinate and there are different techniques depending upon uh, the crop that you're growing. For tomatoes um, that have these little uh, yellow trumpet shaped flowers, there are different techniques. One is just sort of tapping them or gently shaking the plant. Another is to take a Q-tip and sort of tap on the bottom of the bell, but you have to be careful not to knock the flowers off if you do that. Uh, for things like squash and zucchini, uh, you have to learn the difference between male and female flowers. There are wonderful YouTube videos for this, gorgeous YouTube videos for this tremendous source for gardening. If you don't know anyone who can show you what a male or female flower looks like. Um, if, you, if you hand pollinate, um, you can use a, 
Q-tip, you can use a paintbrush, things like that. But whatever you do, I like using Q-tips because you can throw it away each time and you're not transferring anything um, bad from one plant to another. But some people have a great luck with um, like little mop sable paint brushes, but you have to sterilize it each time you use it if you, if you do that. Um, but I was really surprised at how few pollinators there were to try to counteract that um, and give the pollinators some support. This year I am putting out lilacs and I am putting marigolds anywhere they will fit. We're going to co-plant marigolds as much as we can. And uh, I, again, I am not an expert, if you, but if you search about co-planting, it's what uh, you can grow together in the same container and uh, marigolds go with just about anything and they put beneficial substances in the soil. They repel insects that you don't want and attract insects that you do want. So again, this is, this is a way to support getting your plants pollinated naturally and uh, do something that's environmentally friendly and then also you get pretty marigolds. So hopefully we will um, be putting those in uh, to the beds and and the containers. Let me ask uh, Deb, do we have any questions? Any any uh, in the chat? You're, you're, you're muted. Okay. Unmute. Okay. So in terms of when do you want to get started if you actually want to harvest some vegetables? I'd say get started now. Mm -hmm. Get started now. Um, there, uh, because of the pandemic, a lot of people are ordering seeds. Um, I really like, um, there's a, a company called Baker Creek and just about everything they sell is heirloom. They also give you a free packet of seeds with each order. Like, uh, they, they don't tell you what it is. They are trying to diversify you. And I've had good luck with all of their stuff. Their germination rate is excellent. Really excellent. Uh, another company I like is called Park Seed. Um, then there's a company called True Leaf. Uh, also Home Depot, the local stores have seeds, uh, whatever you like. Also, if you have gardening friends, uh, because some seeds come hundreds to a packet and you're only gonna be using a dozen and you're happy to share. And I think at the end of the presentation, we're going to ask if people are interested in sort of starting a neighborhood gardening network uh, for, for sharing, you know, within COVID guidelines and social distancing, whatever is recommended to comply with that. But, uh, you know, to, to say, yes, I have seeds to share or starters to share, or uh, if you're doing tomatoes and you have, uh, let's say a little extra rock phosphate or you're not gonna use it all, uh, which is a soil amendment to provide um, minerals that the tomatoes need. Um, it, it, they sell it in these gigantic bags and most people are not going to use as, as much as they buy. So starting a neighborhood sharing network, I think would be helpful helpful to, to all of us and we can learn from each other. Uh, so uh, in terms of um, preserving your harvest, that's also a, an issue as if you're, uh, and being able to harvest regularly, because if you're, if you're keeping your garden organic, you can harvest even the same day that you spray. If you're spraying um, uh, neem oil or you're spraying BT, yes, you wanna rinse off what you're harvesting, but uh, with organic gardening, you can harvest usually same day, no matter what you are, are spraying. Um, we did not have, uh, we used this like a, a kitchen garden. So we were using at, at the time of harvest, we had some overage on the tomatoes, um, not enough to can really, but we made um, refrigerator pickles with them. Mm -hmm. And there are instructions online for how to do it safely. They do not mm -hmm. keep forever. You must keep them in the refrigerator. But we had great pickled tomatoes. Pickled tomatoes is a great way to use things that don't quite ripen on the vine. Um, you can also do this with different kinds of squash and cucumbers as, as well. So if you have more than you can use, and you can't find anybody to take them, you can make refrigerator pickles. Yep. I, uh, there are some articles about how to freeze things. I'm not a big fan of that. I didn't have good results with that. 
but for short-term preservation, making refrigerator pickle is, is fine and it works and it's nice and it gives you another six or seven weeks after harvest. Uh, we were able to harvest through the beginning of November, through the beginning of November, because this year uh, the first frost was not until later in into November. So uh, I was originally planning to pull the tomatoes around Halloween. And then I saw that there were, there was continual develop, some continuous developments. I figured, you know, let's, let's see what happens. And we were able to get another couple dozen off of there. Um, this, this is something also you can try at the end of the season. Um, particularly with tomatoes, if you have uh, a high branch on a tomato plant that still has fruit on it or still has flowers on it and you have grow lights, cut it low and you can put it in even a barilla jar of water, not, not even soil, and you can keep it going for another three or four weeks. And that's usually enough time for the tomatoes to ripen. So mm. I had tomatoes um, you know, from established plants, but in spaghetti sauce jars under grow lights. And I was pulling tomatoes off of there for about two months. Mm. Uh, so uh, you can have decent results. And again, I was an absolute rookie last year. And I had helpful neighbors and YouTube is great. And you too can do this and it will work for you. That, oh. was, fa that was fabulous. Oh my Absolutely goodness. fabulous. And, um, and what's, yeah, what's great also is that you guys have really complimented one another. We have, we have the flower gardens and we have the, and we have the vegetables. Uh, and also the fact that there are people who are going to be in limited space. I, I don't know if we have anybody on with us, but I'm sure some of our members are, are living in apartments or living, you know, where they have maybe just a, a balcony in which to grow, but they can do that too. So this was inspiring. If we have any questions. Before yeah, I, 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 I had I, gathered some, I had gathered some questions ahead of time um, from some, some other folks. A couple of things. I see online quite a bit. That you think that people should use things like cinnamon, white vinegar, or eggshells in their gardens to help uh, do away with pests or keep the animals away. Betsy or Robert, have you heard or used any of these methods that, uh, again, can help you with gardening? Um, I've heard, uh, I not, not a lot. Um, the vinegar can be somewhat controversial, um, especially as a weed killer, because the strength you need to use is toxic. It's, you know, herbicides are herbicides. It's really important to remember that, um, you know, organic or not, or, um, you know, they, they're, they're strong things. So the, the vinegar is, is tricky. Um, the eggshells, I understand, is good for keeping away slugs. Um, and I have used cinnamon as a uh, plant antibiotic. Um, like if you're cutting something, but I haven't used it to keep anything away. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. I thought I had heard that. You know, when, when you're cutting uh, orchids, especially, which I've given up on. Yeah, I, I had good luck with using uh, cinnamon when I was trying to keep the tomatoes going when I, you know, because I had this, this dream of, oh, I can clone them. And uh, it, they didn't work, they, they didn't last, oh. but you know, I was able to get the fruit off them. So before I put them in, uh, in water, in the, in the jars, I um, dipped them in the cinnamon mm -hmm. and it worked well. And I actually did that also with part of a cucumber vine that was still very, very vigorous. Uh, in terms of eggshells, you can save eggshells if you're going to plant tomatoes because a, uh, tomatoes need a lot of calcium and um, you can use uh, a commercial product or um, if you're going to plant tomatoes, you need um, Epsom salts for magnesium. Mm -hmm. Uh, you need calcium to avoid something called blossom end rot because the first time you see it, it's like, oh no, what got to this tomato? Uh, it's like, this is a black cavity that forms 
on, on the tomato, but that's it's lack of calcium. So some people add calcium uh, by crushing up eggshells, saving their eggshells and, and crushing them. So you could, could do that. I have not used vinegar, but I do remember um, one of the YouTube series that I like the best is a, a, a gentleman named Brian and he has something called Next Level Gardening or California Garden TV. I think it's the same thing, but with uh, I think Next Level Gardening would work better if you search that and his name is Brian. And he explains how to use uh, household things and he tells you what not to do. And one mm. of the things he has a couple of segments on is don't use vinegar and uh, some people use coffee grounds for various purposes. And he, he explains why you shouldn't do that. Yeah. And he shows you examples. Like he, he's very brave. If something has gone wrong for him, he shows you the damage. He's very honest. And I learned a lot from him. So it's um, Brian and his show is Next Level Gardening on YouTube. And I, you. I found him very useful. Thank you, Robin. I wanted to ask, and this is my own personal question for Betsy. I've got ornamental grasses up the wazoo. I love them because they they last forever. They show up great. But but you talked about cutting them down now. How short should they be cut down? Um, do, well, what kinds do you have? Um, I have got sedges. I've got um, uh, fountain grasses. Um, I've got, you know, big things that grow up, you know, I mean, it's almost six feet tall in the front. Right. Um, so I've got a lot of grasses of various types. I love it. So the, the low sedges, like the Pennsylvania, the carices. Yeah, the carices, um, yeah. I, I went to a whole lecture on grasses once and the, and the lady said, you know, in the wild, nobody cuts his back. Oh, okay. So, so last year I did not cut back my carex. And you know what? It looked great. Okay. I, I didn't cut it back at all. Uh, I have a lot of it, you know, I have a big swath of it. The taller grasses, um, when, when the, the um, you, know, you start to see the little shoots come up, mm -hmm. I cut it back, but I don't, you know, you don't need to cut it back real far. You don't want to cut it back so that you injure the really tender little right. uh, ones that are coming up. And it really, honestly, it's more for Aesthetics. Aesthetics. Um, okay. So, you know, so I cut it, I, you know, the, I don't have any, I actually installed a, a, a um, garden at my synagogue and I have um, um, Carl Forrester Calamagrostis, which grows like way, you know, four feet tall. I cut it back to about a foot, foot and a half. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you don't cut them all the way down to the ground and some people yeah. like round them, you know, yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> cut them off. And I'll tell you that my favorite, I, I'm, I'm saying this as Betsy Kingery, not as a master gardener, but there's a catalog, um, uh, A.M. Leonard. Very dangerous. It's like politics and prose to a book junkie. Um, but they have some scissors, some big scissors. They're mm -hmm. not the... These are scissors and they're great for cutting grasses. And if you have a lot of grasses, it's worth it. But, you know, cut it to about eight inches to a foot so that you don't damage the new growth coming up. I've had, this, had a lot of great luck with a lot of the grasses because the, the, Barbara knows who is down the street from me. We have like a parade that comes through yeah. our neighborhood, eight or nine at a time. So um, it's tough in our I, area. I live in a neighborhood where you're not allowed to have front yard fences. My entire yard is in the front because my house is built. I, I have a half acre lot. Probably two thirds of my lawn is in the front. In the front. Um, I, we have, I live, you know, a stone's throw from Rock Creek Park. Mm. So here they sleep in my yard. One had a baby in my yard. Yeah. Yes! Yeah, we <laughs> that. And it was like, yeah. uh, you know, so so I've gotten I've gotten good at, at deer pressure, but they won't eat they don't eat grasses. Uh, most of the yeah, plants that I showed you, uh, deer don't don't gobble up. I have much more trouble with um, chipmunks. It's great. I've got I have them too. It's really it's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do have one other question, then I'll you know, turn it back over to other people. You know, that have something. Um, I'm trying to think about. Uh, milkweed and all that for this year because I really would like to get more butterflies and so forth in there. Do either of you, 
have an opinion about growing, you know, just all the old wild milk feed that you find out in the field um, for, for yes. pollinating? The, the, well, the, the butterfly weed, uh, the Escapolis tuberosa that I showed you, um, is a, it's a milkweed. Um, the, the swamp milkweed, Asclepius fistulosa, I don't, you know, I'm sorry, I, I don't have my roller deck in front of me, but that swamp milkweed, it, it'll take over the entire yard. I mean, oh, you know, yeah. where we go in Canada, it is just everywhere. It, it grows anywhere, everywhere. Um, it's very aggressive. So you don't want to grow that unless you really, really, really want a lot of butterflies. The, the Monarda, the um, Agastache, most of the sun plants I showed you will attract butterflies. The um, Pycnanthemum, the, the mountain mint. Um, the one thing you don't want to do is go buy a, a bag of, you know, pollinator seeds. Many of those seeds are not natives. Um, mm -hmm. and there is a difference between the quality of what a butterfly will get out of a butterfly bush, which you should not grow actually. The buddleias have become, they're on the um, invasive list now, mm -hmm. as opposed to butterfly weed, which are the Asclepiuses. Um, so um, I'd be happy to sort of help you, or if you go to the HGIC, my uh, Master Gardener website, there's a whole pollinator okay, cool. thing there. But yeah, I, I would, if you want the pink flowers, uh, you got to be really careful. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Anybody else have any? Oh, I see, right. I, I see folks that are having to sign off because it is just about six o'clock. It is just about. This has probably the, been the most successful and interesting uh, program that we have had. So um, we want to thank you very, very much. And I have a feeling this is going to be a continuing conversation, if you don't mind, um, because we, there was a question about what, whether we could have a copy of your slide deck, if you would share it with us, that would be great. And as, as Robin said, we were thinking of making this, uh, you know, whether we can stimulate a, a gardening group within the Kent Mill Village and within the neighborhood. Uh, there seems to be a real interest, and I think that would be great. And and it's COVID friendly. We can be yes. outdoors. We yeah. can talk to one another, even with our masks on. We can see other what other people are doing. So yes. it's a very, very good idea. And we thank you so much, Betsy. For trying. And, Bet Be and Betsy, don't be surprised if we call you for a summer update and a fall shutdown. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you, you and Robin. In the summer, once I get vaccinated, I'm on my way to Ontario. Oh, that's right. That's yeah, right. What? Absolute, absolute. Mm -hmm. I, I have done, I have done uh, Zoom up there. So, uh, Robin, thank you for your talk. Thank um, you, Robin. That, that was oh, terrific. Yeah. Um, guys, terrific. You need to become a master gardener. I think <laughs> she got, think she got it, doesn't she? Yeah. Okay. She's got um, I need to go. I've got another Zoom. Yes, okay. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Nice thank meeting. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Bye. All right, I will cut the S. Uh, I want to thank everybody else for coming. Uh, for those of you, who we really, we kept a lot of participants here and uh, it was great. This is great. Okay, I will uh, have a good night. I'm going to close it out. Thanks, Barbara. Take care. Hello.